The problem of evil and suffering in the world is very real. We have only to look at the world. We look at Cyclone, Idea, and Mozambique, and it's spread elsewhere, and we see the very real suffering. We have personal encounters. We have a close friend who today, who was part of this parish, who today is mourning the, the 10th anniversary of, of their one child's death, and they lost both two children in strange incidences, and yet we have three children who are who are safe and flourishing. These are the struggles. Today we journey with pain and suffering, with evil. We journey intellectually and we journey emotionally. And I encourage you, I hope you've got a notebook with you because there'll be some parts that will be quite things to chew on. Um, and that is good. And you can come back and reflect on. And there will be some that touch us emotionally. If you've come expecting all the answers, you're going to be disappointed. The older I get, the more questions I have of God. It's not that I don't trust him. My trust and love for him grows more and more the more I experience and encounter him. But it's those struggles with what he does or allows to do that I don't fully understand. For some, this is a real stumbling block and questions how they see God. This is an important journey. And we recognize that people have been grappling with this for centuries, but the question is, does anyone really have a full answer to these things. Perhaps not. Perhaps we weren't meant to. I want to read a quote, Callisto Ware. It is not the task of Christianity to pr provide easy answers to every question, but to make us progressively aware of a mystery. God is not so much the object of our knowledge as the cause of our wonder and love. So I want to invite you to journey with us, to journey with the questions, to grapple with the answers. But don't lose sight of the most important journey. When Jesus was with his disciples, he didn't explain the theory of atonement. He showed it to them over a meal. Today, as we journey, Jesus would journey with us. He would journey with us to the cross, his answer to us. We don't journey this afternoon with theories, we journey with him. May he speak to you and to your lives into your specific situations, into your questions, into your grappling. And we invite you, just a reminder that when it's a, a song, if you need to go, you're welcome to leave quietly. Also in the reflection time, if you want to read scripture, if you want to sit quietly, if you want to journal, it's your choice. It's, it's a journey that we go together as we go to the cross. So let's stand to offer this service to the Lord and worship him. Lord, today is a day of significance. It is a day for us of mourning, but it is also a day of celebration. Good Friday. Lord, may this time be a time of journeying with you. We open our hearts to you. We would worship you, Jesus, the one who died for us. In your precious name, amen. God is good. All the time? Scripture tells us that hundreds of times. The absolute goodness of God. One example is Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Now this first part we're going to do some grappling with what that's all about. If God is all good, and he is the sovereign one, how does evil exist? The problem is, either God can do nothing to stop catastrophes, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. God is either, either impotent, either he doesn't have the power, he's evil, he's not good, or he's imaginary. To talk about the problem of evil, we first need to talk about the problem of goodness. While all people struggle with evil, on an emotional level and a personal level. It's not a theological problem for most. In fact, it is only for the Judeo-Christian belief that the problem of goodness exists, that evil on a theological basis is a struggle. If we look at other religions, and just to go through them, and I think this is an important journey, for those who believe in many gods, for the polytheistic view, they have many gods that are a mixture of good and evil. So the problem 
of a good God reigning over all, but yet there's evil, is not an issue. The second one, monism, where all is of the same reality. So there's nothing, there's no separation. There is all is one. Hinduism, Buddhism are those examples where we're all part of one transcendent being, Brahman. So all distinctions we see in the world aren't really there. And the creator and the creator, there's no distinction because we're all one. So even evil and good are one. There's no difference. So there's no issue here because evil and good exist together. Material monism, otherwise known as atheism, there's no transcendent reality at all. There's no God. So all it is about is the evolutionary progress of people. And we mess up because we're on progress. The thing that is harder for atheism to explain is goodness and altruism. Dualism is another easy way of getting over the problem, and we can apply this to Christianity. Some people do wrongly. God produces good, while there's this equal and independent power producing evil and messing everything up on this world. Christianity can easily slide in this direction. It's correct that the world is war at war, but dualism gives Satan far more power than is due to him. Because Satan is God, he never has been and he never will be. He is not omnipotent, he is not omniscient, he is not God. He's not omnipresent. As an angel, a fallen angel, he's a created being. And he's subject to God's authority and ultimate control. Yes, we must take him seriously, but we mustn't give him more power than is due to him. Yes, he's at this current time as the prince of this world, but God is ultimately sovereign. He is transcendent. The devil has never been a threat to God and never will be. God in his wisdom is choosing to work all things out for his good. And this is an important recognition for us as we journey with evil. Christianity. Our creator God is separate from the world. He is good. He's only good. And everything that is good is from him. This very day encapsulates the essence of that goodness. Yes, suffering and evil we see as a part of this day. And yet it is called Good Friday because that is our starting point. We start from the cross. God's gift to us to reconcile us, to remove that separation where because of our free will we chose to separate ourselves from God and to separate ourselves from his goodness. So evil is the consequence of the absence of good. It's important that we recognize that, that this is a problem that we specifically as Christians have faced. God is good and he's overall. The problem of God's goodness is often used as a reason he doesn't exist. Well, if you say God's good, he obviously doesn't exist. But I'd ask you, where do strong moral instincts come from? Evolution can't explain that feeling of rightness. You know the feeling, this is what I should be doing. If there is no God, on what basis do you say to someone, what you have done is wrong? If the sense of morality is only coming from you, because who, who's to say that your morality is greater than theirs? The interesting thing is people will seldom d disagree with your standard of morality. They may disagree. They may try and justify themselves. Someone pushes in the queue in front of you. They won't say, well, your standard of morality is wrong. It's fine to push in front of the queue. It'll usually be that they're justifying their reason. The conclusion of the Nuremberg trials, um, one of the most significant events of the 20th century. Listen to the words they said at the end. There are some actions that are so intrinsically terrible that they run counter to the proper nature of human beings. What is that proper nature? Which is true essentially cross-culturally across time and place. These are evil actions. No excuses are available for engaging in them. So as we look at this problem of goodness, there needs to be a question. Where does this common nature come from? But that it is imprinted on our very soul by him whose nature it reflects. 
The third thing I want to look at in this goodness before we look at evil is the definition of goodness. How do we define goodness? And I think often we give it a very boxed, limited definition, a very tame definition, a definition that's about the do not disturb me sign. As long as I can carry on my way, then it's good. Jesus is our definition of goodness. We see him calling the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. We see him with a whip in the temple. We see him deserting people, needing healing, going somewhere else because he felt led there. That song came to mind, you are good. You're never going to let me down. The reality is, in our own definition of goodness, God is going to let us down. Everything will not always be happy. While scripture promises the goodness of God, it also promises us that in this world we will have trouble. How do we reconcile that if we've got this limited definition of goodness? It's important that each one of us journey with our definition of goodness. To realize that we may be looking and seeing God as the benevolent grandfather, doing everything that we, letting us do what we want to, as opposed to the guiding, loving, heavenly father, showing true love. God's love for us is the deepest, most tragic, most inexorable type. God's goodness is different from ours, but not fundamentally, as a perfect circle differs from a child's attempt at drawing a circle. So God's goodness differs from ours. But yet we know what it is that we're trying to draw. In the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Lucy asks Mr. Beaver, if Aslan is safe, the reply, of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. We need to realize that our definition of goodness is like a child's drawing. We need to allow God to show us what his untamed, unsafe goodness looks like. We've journeyed with the theological problem of goodness. It's a problem unique to the Judea Christian God, who is good and there's no evil found in him. We've journeyed with the reality of good, the evidence across time and space, the imprint of God's goodness on the human heart. And we've journeyed with the definition of goodness. And with that definition comes an invitation to allow God to show us more of what his untamed, unsafe goodness looks like as we journey with our questions. I want us to lead us into a time of reflection with this quote. His goodness is beyond our ability to comprehend, but not our ability to experience. Our hearts will take us where our heads can't fit. So I just invite you in a few minutes to have a reflection on God's goodness and thank him for it in your life. Before we 
We're now going to have a reading from Genesis. The reading may be found on page two of the Pew Bible. We read from Genesis chapter one, verses 27 and 28, then chapter three, verses one to 15. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her And he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. And he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Hear the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. We've looked at the reality of goodness. God is good, and him is no evil at all. But that highlights rather than negates the problem of evil. Either God can do nothing to stop evil, or he doesn't care to, or he doesn't exist. God is either impotent, evil, or imaginary, is what is often leveled at Christianity. We see the moral evil, the rape and murder of a child, We see lots of pain and suffering around us. We see structural evil, or maybe we turn a blind eye to it. Many poor communities with not their basics, while many wallow in excess. And that's tough for the wealthy to hear. We struggle with evil theologically. We struggle with it emotionally. It has a global impact, but it also has a local, personal impact. What does the Bible have to say about evil? And we're starting at the beginning, at the very beginning. God created man and woman to rule and reign over creation. That was their mandate. God's kingdom was full of goodness and life and love. All relationships were in their right way. Right relationship with God, right relationship with each other, with themselves and with creation. They were created to live dependent on their creator in love and trust. And then, of course, we see the snake. Satan gets Adam and Eve to question what God said. He plants that seed of rebellion in their hearts. He questions God's motive for giving the command not to eat the forbidden fruit. You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. He uses... Sorry, he accuses God of using his commands to protect himself from humanity by keeping people from being like him, from keeping his power to himself. God is not really good. By questioning the character of God, they're questioning the identity of God. And by that, they're questioning their own identity because they're created in relation to God. And of course, we know the eight Tragically, through an act, they tried to obtain what was theirs by design. For they were created in God's image. They were like him, but they willfully disobeyed him. The devil lies about who God is and in turn who we are. It's all about identity. He destroys our identity and purpose. Through rebellion, Satan lost his place of identity for eternity, and he's trying to do the same with that part of God's creation that was made in his image. And the result with Adam and Eve, their eyes were opened, they felt shame, they felt nakedness. There was brokenness in their relationship with their Heavenly Father, with themselves, with each other, and with creation, as they were banished from the garden. But even there, we see a promise. Genesis 3.15, an offspring of Eve, it's spoken of as singular, one offspring. He will crush your head, this is to the snake, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The death, but then the resurrection of Jesus conquering Satan. Jesus came as the rescuer, the plan of God, even at the time of creation, to rescue us that right relationships may be restored with him. But why then did God give us free will? Why did he allow us to do evil? I like the way C.S. Lewis puts it. Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of creatures that work like machines is hardly worth creating. Can one call that love We can't imagine why we say God is all-powerful. How can he give free will and withhold free will at the same time? Because the two are mutually exclusive. Imagine God corrected all abuse. You can imagine lifting up something to hit someone. You've got a bat and you're going to hit, hopefully not hit a child. And it turns into something soft. 
that won't hurt anyone. As you're about to hit, it turns into a grassy thing that won't hurt. But then we've got to take it further because then even as a thought comes into our mind, it's got to be turned into something that is not hurtful. And then there is not free will at all. The happiness which God designs for humans is the happiness of being freely and voluntarily united to his unimaginable, his immense love, and to have, share that love with each other. He thought that worth the risk. He thought it was a price worth paying. The moment you have self at all, there's the possibility of putting self first, wanting to be the center, wanting to be God. That was the sin of Satan. It was the sin he taught us. He taught human beings to try and create happiness for themselves outside of God, apart from God. And it's out of that hopeless attempt that we see poverty, we see wars, we see slavery, we see prostitution, we see these empires being built. The long, terrible story of mankind trying to find something other than God which will make them happy. Why will that never succeed? God made us. He invented us as a man would invent a car. You see, a car is made to run on petrol and won't run properly on anything else. God created us to run on him. He himself is the fuel of our spirits. We're designed to feed on him. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. Selfish and cruel people, people trying to run on the wrong juice. That's what Satan's done to humans. That's what he's done to us. When we talk about evil, think of something evil. You tend to think of something out there. God, fix it. Fix them. I want us to pause. Earlier I spoke of that common standard of goodness ingrained in all of us. It's real and pressing on us. Unlike the law of gravity, it doesn't just happen automatically that we live that out. In fact, just the opposite, and we relate to Paul, who says, what I want to do, I don't do, and the good that I, I don't want to do, the, sorry, the bad that I don't want to do, I do. Sin is so severe, and it's terminal in every case. It cannot be overlooked. The presence and power of sin has scarred all that God has made. We cannot look on evil without looking at sin. We cannot look at, uh, at sin without looking at ourselves. See, because there's this gap between that moral compass and reality. We don't want to face it. People are often looking for comfort in Christianity. But the reality is, as we go after comfort, we won't find it. But as we go after truth, we will find both truth and comfort. With psychoanalysis, often it's about get rid of, getting rid of that shame that one feels. Blaming it on something or someone else. And yes, there can be a good element for that. I'm not saying that. But we need to be aware. We need to be aware too of a watered-down definition of good. I mentioned that earlier. But where it's all about being kind to everyone. Contrasting with Jesus' table-turning kind of good. I don't know if you've ever cut out a template for something. And you, maybe you've had to do 50 or 100 of them. And you've used the previous one to copy the last one. And you get to the last one and it's meant to look like the first one. And there's a vast difference and you're in trouble. And how that can so easily happen to us. We can compare ourselves with people either in the generation before us or with those people around us. And excuse our morality instead of looking at Jesus Christ. The original measurement. Perception and reality are often different. I had a, had a good race the other day. And so my timing, but that's now become my normal. What's your normal time? That's now my normal. So if I have a normal day, I would classify, oh, that was a bad run. And it's easy how we can do that with ourselves. That when we have uh, something that's, that's bad for us, we say that's normal. Sorry, the other way around. When it's normal, we're saying it's bad. When we have a great day, we perceive it as our normal. 
We long for God to deal out justice. But then we shudder because we know that if God were to do that right now and deal out instant justice, that none of us would escape. For whatever grades and levels of evil there are people in general, we know that there's something that lurks in our own heart. The evil we so much would prevent or punish in others is right there inside ourselves. We might hide it from ourselves, but it's there nonetheless. Also, in things we don't even realize. Perhaps the shirt on your back was made by a child who never sees the light of day. Perhaps the food you ate got cheaply was made by those under very cruel circumstances. We don't know. Does our ignorance exonerate us? I don't know. As we try to stand in judgment on God, on the problem of evil, we don't really have a leg to stand on ourselves. Psalm 130 verse 3, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? And the answer is not a single, solitary one of us. Sin's a tough journey. It's a tough one. We want to move on to the good stuff. I want to come back to that definition of sin is looking for happiness and peace apart from God himself, running on our own juice. And the result of that is the good that we want to do, we don't do. Today, while we glorify keeping people happy as being good, it's okay for us to be our own authority. It's okay for us to run on our own juice. Is self-idolatry perhaps the ultimate evil of our age? As we enjoy the goodness of God's creation, we must at the same time accept the Bible's diagnosis of how radical, pervasive, and deeply ingrained sin has become in human life and relationships. Only God in his omniscience can unravel such interweavings of evil. But the Bible points to the blame for that, where most of it lies, and that's on us as the collective human reality. From the moment we become aware of God is the alternative to choose self over God. And daily, we take this. Perhaps we start our day and we are, uh, uh, we're focused fully, our hearts are focused on God, but by the time we've come out of the shower, it's our day and we're giving God a little portion of our day. It's about our own. Jordan Peterson, not a Christian himself, and actually quite controversial. He was, uh, there was an article for him about the problem of evil, and this is very interesting. He said, become aware of your own insufficiency. Consider the murderousness of your own spirit before you dare accuse others and before you attempt to repair the fabric of the world. Maybe it's not the world that, that's at fault. Maybe it's you. You failed to make the mark. You've missed the target. You've sinned. And all that is your con contribution to the insufficiency and evil of the world. The message from a non-Christian to us, we nailed Jesus to the cross. Jordan Peterson's solution was to attempt to bring meaning, and that will bring healing, that will fix all your rights by doing good, by building something very good. But we know differently. We know by experience that you can't just decide to sin no more, to do good. That no number of good deeds can make up for our sin. We can't go after meaning to make amends. We can't assume safety in numbers. Everyone's doing it, so I'm fine. We can't assume that time cancels sin. We can't laugh about unrepented childhood sins. The sin or evil in us, which sin is, is washed out, not by putting meaning in the world, but it's by repentance, by the blood of Jesus, by faith in him. We're called to remember the weight of our own sin as we stand in judgment of others, as we try and stand in judgment of God on the problem of evil. We too have contributed to the evil in the world. We need to remember the price of that forgiveness. We're made new by the Holy Spirit. We, we're transformed, but we have to make that choice not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed into his likeness. So I want to invite us 
to have a time of reflection. We say remove evil. It's about starting with us. What juice are we running on? Here's the picture. We don't know that it was an apple. It was a fruit. But what is it that Satan would hold us out to us that would become self-idolatry for us? The problem of evil is a problem of us. Let's have a couple minutes' reflection. I'm reading from Romans chapter 5, verses 5 to 8, and then verses 15 to 17. This may be found on page 1028 of the Pew Bible. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way, Death came to all people because all sinned. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? I'm now going to read from... John, chapter 10, verses 10 to 15. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. 
I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hard hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hard hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. End of the reading. Evil is real. Evil is in the world. Evil is in us. The gap between the moral nature that God has stamped on our hearts and the actions of our lives, and more importantly, the thoughts, attitudes, and motives of our minds and hearts. The constant struggle, even as Christians, to choose and live God's way, when seeming the constant pull to return self to the throne, to live independently of God. We've looked at understanding evil in the context of free will, that free will given to us by a loving creator who's looking for that response of love rather than automated response. But there's still gaps. There's still questions unanswered. And perhaps Kevin and Robin and Steve are going to solve them all. But I think they still will remain unsolved. Evil is not from God, but yet he still works his sovereign plan through it. He works for our good. He chooses to answer prayer for some, for others not. In certain circumstances, we don't understand. Some people like to package it neatly in a parcel. I don't believe that it can be done. Evil, inex inexplicable, horrible evil, just does not make sense. And I'm sure every one of us can think of one example at this moment. But surely that's the image of God in us responding to it. The very essence of evil is the negation of all goodness. And sense is a good thing. Evil has no proper place in all creation, so it shouldn't make sense. It did not intrinsically belong to the world that God created. And it does not belong to that when God will fully redeem his world. While we grapple with evil, and we grapple with the message of Scripture, and it's good to journey with that, for whatever reason, God in his wisdom has chosen not to explain the origin of evil. But rather, he wants us to focus our attention on what he has done to defeat and destroy it. To point us to him, to his love, to the cross. The starting point for the struggle against evil, as Tim Keller said, is not the question of why does God allow evil and suffering. Our first question should rather be, if Jesus really is God, what in the world is God doing on a cross? I want to read this quote from Madeleine Lengel. What I believe is so magnificent, so glorious, that it is beyond finite comprehension. To believe that the universe was created by a purposeful, benign creator is one thing. To believe that this creator took on human vesture, accepted death and mortality, was tempted, betrayed, broken, and all for love for us, of us, defies reason. It is so wild that it terrifies some Christians who try to dogmatize their fear by lashing out at other Christians. Because tidy Christianity, with all answers given, is easier than one which reaches out to the wild wonder of God's love, a love we don't even have to earn. While the cross doesn't tell us the reason for suffering, in fact, we see it as we look on the cross, evil, suffering, injustice. But the cross immediately tells us what it isn't. It can't be that God doesn't care. It can't be that God isn't sovereign because God planned the cross before creation. You see, we don't accept Christianity because of its wonderful explanation for evil and suffering. 
We accept it because Jesus Christ is the risen Lord and King. Everything follows from this. Everything follows from this. I want to end by coming back to the beginning, to the garden. Satan didn't come into the garden and violently take possession of Adam and Eve. He couldn't. He had no dominion there. You see, Adam and Eve had been given dominion. They had been given rule and reign. They had been given those keys. So his temptation to them was to get them to put themselves on the throne and by doing that, hand the keys over to Satan as they made their agreement with him. And to this day, it's through agreement that he sets ourselves, we set ourselves up against God as our own lords. And it's through that that the devil is able to kill, steal, and destroy. Mankind's authority to rule was forfeited when Adam ate that forbidden fruit. It says in Romans 6.16, you are the slaves to the one whom you obey. In that one act, humankind went from ruler over a planet to the slave and possession of the evil one. All that Adam owned, including the title deed to the planet, with its corresponding position of rule, became part of the devil's spoils. But then we see that God's predetermined plan of redemption kicked in. With that prophecy, Genesis 3.15, he will, you will bite him on the heel and he will crush your head. And we see it in Jesus. Jesus says in Luke 19.10 that he came to seek and save that which was lost. Not only was humankind lost to sin, but his dominion over the planet was lost. In the temptation, when Jesus was tempted, what did Satan say? All this authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whoever I wish, for it has been delivered to me. You see, in the Garden of Eden, it was delivered to Satan. Jesus could have taken the short cut, but Jesus came to recapture that was, which was lost. That is why Jesus could say to Peter and the disciples, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus came healing. He came bringing wholeness. He came restoring his kingdom, his domain. He won back the keys of the kingdom through his death and resurrection. And then he left us with these words, all authority has been given to me, therefore go. Authority to reclaim is in you and it is in me. Your kingdom come. The thief comes only to kill and rob and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life abundantly. God could have destroyed the devil with one word. But he chose to use his delegated authority. And that is us, those made in his image. He insists and insists very loudly that we put right again what is wrong. There's a clear picture we see in the New Testament church as a sign of God's kingdom, indwelt by him, empowered by him, bringing his kingdom. And that call is to each one of us as we look at evil. It's to look at what the call is on each one of us. So I want to end with that quote from the beginning. How we see God is the most important thing about us. It defines how we think and how we live. The way we understand God is the way we will represent him. This is a picture taken a few days ago in Notre Dame. For me, it represents so much more. You see, God's cross is our starting point. Our questions don't start in the rubble, but at the cross. What in the world is God doing on a cross? He does care. He is sovereign. We may not understand that, but we can experience it in our lives. Evil abounds. We have God's faithful promise. He will restore his kingdom, his full rule and reign. Not yet. We see signs of that kingdom. We taste that kingdom in our lives. We see it in the lives of others. We see healing. We see wholeness. We see his presence. And we are called to be signs of that kingdom. Signs of the cross as his delegated authority. We work to defeat evil in his power and in his name. The struggle is real. It starts on our knees as we claim and live his kingdom in our lives and in our hearts. His kingdom of unconditional love. 
of untamed goodness and unsurpassing peace. This last one, there you see the cross shining through. And I want us, that picture of the Roman centurion, the cross representing evil, representing suffering. The Roman centurion, the instigator of that evil, the murderer of Jesus, looking on that cross and saying, surely this man was the son of God. Truly, that was a good Friday. Truly, this is a good Friday. We see redemption brought to God's murderer. We see redemption brought to the Roman centurion. And we see redemption brought to us. Have a moment before we sing of quiet reflection.
Please be seated. John 3.16, we know it well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The issue of suffering is probably one of the most frequently raised objections to the Christian faith. As broken people living in a fallen world, pain and suffering are woven into the fabric of our existence. As Mandy has said, suffering is not a problem for all religions. Not everyone wrestles with it the way we do. So why is it such an acute problem to us? Because it challenges our very belief that God is both all-powerful and all-good. If he loves us, and he has the power to end suffering, why doesn't he? Why would he allow us, his children, to experience pain, sorrow, loss, grief, loneliness, distress, despair, injustice, guilt, helplessness, hopelessness? We talk about the question of suffering. But maybe that's the problem. Maybe we're looking at it the wrong way. What would happen to our experience of suffering if we asked a different question? What about this? How can a loving God not allow suffering? Suffering and love seem like polar opposites. How can a loving God allow us to struggle? It seems like a legitimate question. But what if it isn't? What if it's the wrong way around? What if a better question is actually, how can a loving God not allow us to suffer? What if he allows us to suffer because he loves us? In the beginning, God created man in his own image. 1 John 4 verse 8 tells us God is love. So it follows that we were created in the image of love. As we know full well, God expressed his love for us by giving us free will, the ability to make our own independent decisions. When man chose to follow his own imperfect path, Rather than the perfect one God had set before him, he inadvertently chose the suffering that comes with imperfection. Though the all-knowing God knew this would happen, he still gave us our independence. How How could he not? Suffering is a consequence of choice. Choice is central to love. God is love. When we ask God to remove our suffering, we're asking him to remove our choice. Since you cannot have love without choice, that would mean asking him to remove himself. Removing his love would mean stepping away from us. Is that what we are really asking for? C.S. Lewis puts it like this. It would no doubt have been possible for God to remove by miracle the results of the first sin ever committed by a human being. But this would not have been much good unless he was prepared to remove the results of the second sin and the third and the fourth and so on forever. A world thus continually underpropped and corrected by divine interference would have become a world in which nothing important ever depended on human choice, and in which choice itself would soon cease from the certainty that one of the apparent alternatives before you would lead to no results at all, and was therefore not really an alternative. Because God loves us, he has to give us choice, real 
choice. This means allowing us to choose things that are imperfect, things that he would not choose for us. If we experience suffering as a result of this, let it be a reminder, albeit a painful one, of God's intense love for us. God allows us to suffer because he loves us. We can look at the question again from another angle. How can a loving God allow suffering? Well, what if he didn't? What if he prevented or removed all elements of suffering? How would that look? Imagine the world as we know it, but with no sickness, no pain, no death, no loss, no rejection, no hunger, no injustice. How exactly would this happen? Would no one get sick or injured, even if they jumped off a four-story building? What implications might that have? Would no one ever die? Or would we just not feel any pain or sorrow? Would there be plenty of food for everyone? Or would we just never experience hunger? Would we all agree and get along famously? Or would we just not feel anything about our differences? Would they never challenge us? Would they never make us search for more? Would everything be easy? Or would we just not notice the discomfort? At the very least, we know doctors, lawyers, psychologists, inventors, engineers, and anyone else whose job it is to make the world a better place would probably become redundant. What would we do instead? The problem with suffering is that it doesn't exist in isolation. It's part of something far more complex than that. Like a woven tapestry, pull one thread and the whole picture starts to unravel. Think carefully about your own experience of suffering. If God were to remove the suffering, what else would change? What would you gain? What would you lose? What might someone else lose? So if he allows us to suffer because he loves us, and removing that suffering would have consequences far greater than we could possibly imagine, can we use another question? What happens when God allows suffering? Not if, but when. Reflect again on your own experience of suffering. What happened? What happened before? What happened at the time? What happened afterwards? What's been happening since? Ten years ago, my father died, and my entire world was turned upside down. And I hate that he wasn't there on my wedding day to walk me down the aisle. And I hate that he hasn't seen my children, and they will never know him. I hate that my husband never got to know him. But the lessons I learned while he was sick, while he was dying, when he died, and what's happened thereafter, they've been absolutely mind-blowing. 
Would I rather have him here? Some days. But in a big way, God has more than compensated. Suffering does not exist in isolation. It can't. Not when God is involved. So what does it do for us? Well, the first thing, it reminds us that we're vulnerable. It reminds us that no matter how strong and independent we think we are, we're not enough on our own. This has two very important consequences. First, it draws us into community, reminding us that we were created for relationship. The first thing we did was break our relationship with God. Suffering takes us one step closer to his original plan for us. Secondly, suffering draws us closer to him, closer to his heart. Our breaking hearts cry out for comfort, for answers, for something we can't find anywhere else. When the world leaves us empty, we turn to the only thing that can make us whole. Whether we look for him or not, suffering gives God an opportunity to show himself. Sometimes he chooses to stand front and center by performing great miracles or bringing great changes. Often he works through others to bring healing, comfort, truth, or relief. But always he works within us, offering love, joy, peace, patience, strength, courage, and the promise that we're never alone. Any of us faced with suffering will at times ask what the purpose of it all is and where God can be found. Paul himself, who experienced intense suffering, tells us that we can be absolutely sure that God is working in our lives through it. He says in his letter to the Romans, we know that in all things, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God doesn't cause suffering but he certainly uses it. And if we let him, he can take the tangled mess of our circumstances, straighten out the threads, and stitch them carefully together to make something more beautiful than we could ever have imagined. Think again of your own experience or experiences of suffering. How is God using them? How is he using them for you? How is he using them for others? Thirdly, God gives us, oh God, thirdly, suffering gives us an opportunity to shine. I've never felt comfortable with the idea of God testing us. It always gives me this impression of a a juvenile, almost sadistic teacher waiting for the students to slip up. But that's not what God's testing really is. He's more like a coach who, after spending intense one-on-one time with a player, carefully showing him what to do and how to do it, sends him out onto the field where it really matters. Of course we don't want to suffer, And we don't want others to suffer. We don't want to see suffering. But it has the potential to bring the best out of us and out of others. When we step up and face challenges with confident faith, what happens to us? What happens to others? What happens to God? Peter writes in his first letter, that his readers may all have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. But he goes on to say, these have come so that your faith 
of greater worth than gold may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I don't like that my dad is gone, but I like who I am becoming as a result of it. We can't win the game if we never step out onto the field of play. But if we remember that we have what we have practiced and we listen to the voice of our coach, we can experience great triumph. What about another question? How long will a loving God allow us to suffer? It's one thing to stub your toe. It's another thing not to walk for the rest of your life. If God is our loving Father, how long will he allow us to experience pain? A wise parent believes in loving loving discipline. This means allowing a child to experience the negative consequences of bad choices. But a loving parent wants a child to be happy and fulfilled. So what happens when the parent is both wise and loving? This parent allows the child to suffer, knowing full well that fulfillment is on the other side. To the child, the period of suffering can seem like an absolute eternity. Do you remember ever being put in the naughty corner? or the thinking chair. You couldn't have something. You couldn't do something. Are you still there? The loving parent has a far greater perspective of what eternity really means. And the wise parent knows how much it counts. God promises something far greater than anything the world can offer, the hope of heaven. Paul says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. On another occasion, he wrote, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Gavin Reed, the former Bishop of Maidstone, tells of a boy in his congregation who shattered his back falling down the stairs when he was only one year old. As a result, he was in and out of hospital for most of his life. When Gavin interviewed him one evening at his church, the boy remarked, God is fair. Gavin stopped him and asked, How old are you? Seventeen, said the boy. And how many years have you spent in hospital? Eh, About 13 years, he replied. Do you really think that's fair? The boy's answer was simple. Of course it is. God has all of eternity to make it up to me. One of my favorite comedians is Billy Connolly. And one of his best-known quotes is, I don't understand why people talk about life being short. What do you mean life is short? It's the longest thing you'll ever do. It might sound funny, but we know it's not true. We know it is the exact opposite of true. Life is not the longest thing we'll ever do. Compared to eternity, whatever we are experiencing here is barely a blip on the radar. Like the child sitting in the naughty corner, it might feel like forever. But we have the assurance that our loving, wise, good parent knows what's on the other side. And he knows how much it counts. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts 
are not our thoughts. He is the only one who really knows the bigger picture. Our job, like a child, is to trust him. We have one last question. What on earth is God doing on a cross? How could a loving God allow his only son to suffer? Let's bring it back into the context of Easter. This is Good Friday. It's a day when we remember the agony, the pain, the suffering of the cross. Why would a father allow his son to endure all of this? Because if all that we've said so far is true, then it must also be true for Jesus in human form. It was a reminder of God's love. It was part of something far more complex. It was temporary compared to eternity. And most importantly, it achieved a far greater purpose. It brought us back into relationship and made our original perfection possible.